I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Regardless of what and how weather may seem, rain may come, storms may soon follow, I'm glad that I'm still able to be in the house of the Lord, giving thanks, giving praise, fellowshipping with one another, knowing that truly in the midst of those who have weathered the storm, and with that, let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious God, we're grateful for this body that have come together. Grateful for those who you've brought in the midst. Those who are reminded. And those who have come to be reminded of your miraculous working power in this life, in this world. So most gracious God, have your way in this service. Open up ears, open up hearts, so that we may hear and feel you. Allow your spirit to rest, rule, and abide in this place. It's in your son Jesus' name we do pray, and the people of God said, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Crown Him with Many Crowns, found on page three in your bulletin. For those who are physically able, would you please stand with us? as we crown him Lord of love.
turn to page four for the reading of the uh, litany. Thank you. As we look back along the pathway of our past, we see the presence of your faithfulness, O oh God. God has led us through years of pain and struggle, and the way of peace remains our quick guiding precepts. God will guide us in the way of righteousness for one another. God weeps for us in our ignorance and prays for us to learn the things which bring peace to all people. God has forgiven our fool foolishness and that we, so that we might know the love that is in Christ Jesus. We shall eat the bread of mercy and drink the cup of grace. We seek to show forth God's presence in all our ways. Go forth then, you, you redeemed of the Creator. Serve God daily through the holy covenant, God's will shall reign forever. He's challenged us to our past and here, and we must be a step up.
if you know that God is able to heal our land, won't you give God some praise? I think this is an important time for us. In the midst of peculiar times, in the midst when things seem to go left from right, right to left, that God is still able to hear from heaven and reach down to heal our land. For we have gathered for such a time as this to humble ourselves, to pray and call out to the one whose hand reached far beyond eternity just to say, oh God, heal our land. We're thankful, choir, for that wonderful, wonderful song that reminds us as we move through service that God is able to heal our land. Amen. Amen. bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, this has been a week. It's been a week when we've been reminded of, of the need 
of prayer, of the need of reaching out to you, of the need for church and church family. We ask you to take these gifts that have been given uh, from the heart for the use of building your kingdom, to create that circle of support so needed for our students, for our families, and for the community at large. We ask you to bless our gifts, to bless this church, and to give us the strength and the vision for moving forward. In thy name we pray, amen. Dear friends, we invite all of you now to prepare yourselves, your hearts, and your minds for prayer. We say that this is one of the most powerful moments in our worship experience when we lift up our deepest concerns to God. This has been a traumatic week for our church family, our Atlanta community, for our nation and our world. I can't remember a time when so much has happened in a scant week. Many of us are mourning and grieving the loss of Marcia Edwards and her children, Aaron and Chris. Many of us knew Marcia, knew the children. And so this shocking loss of this family strikes at the very core of our sense of community and family. Desiree went to kindergarten and elementary school with Marcia in Baton Rouge. And so these are not losses which are at a distance. They strike at as many of our children in this congregation, New Chris and New Aaron. And we mourn and we grieve and we are shaken at our very core by what we see all around us. The news that these children were shot on the AU campus or near the AU campus, some of Desiree's students at Spelman shot. Parents send their children to school and they don't expect that they're supposed to be wounded by gun violence. And even as we mourn and as we're rocked to and fro by all of this, we still come because we know God is an awesome God. And even these relentless assaults on our humanity will not diminish our ability to say, thank you, God. We are grateful even now. So beloved, whatever is on your heart, whatever is on your mind, take it to God and see what God will do with it. Let us pray. Lord, sometimes it's hard to even find the words, let alone speak the words that can reflect our sense of terror and grief and loss. Sometimes, Lord, when Bad things happen to good people. We wonder, where is God? Strikes at the very foundation, Lord, of what we believe, but we do believe that you are a loving God. And though there may be times when we don't understand what's in the midst of our experience, we do know, Lord, and trust that you have this very experience in the palm of your hand. Lord, hear our prayers, not only for ourselves, but especially for those who've been wounded 
by death or by suffering, by illness, by loneliness, by disease or defect of mind. Hear our prayers, Lord, as we pray not only for others, but we pray for ourselves that we might not be consumed by the pessimism and pragmaticness of this age, but that we might seek a higher power in everything that we do. Be with the grieving families and the young people who are experiencing grief, we feel too early in their lives. Be with parents who have lost children. Be with children who are separated from their parents. Be with those who would manipulate our realities to serve their own needs. Lord, when it seems like even prayer is futile, Remind us again that you are able to do anything but fail. And help us in our own lives when we see that brick wall. To know that you can tear down any wall. You can build up any house and you can lift up any spirit. Lord, we can't say it all now, but we ask that you would hear our prayers because we're hurting so deeply. Sometimes our hurt would impede our sense of joy and sense even a possibility. But Lord, we know that Jesus died for a reason and we know through faith that he was resurrected for us and for our sakes. So Lord, help us to see the other side, the underside, but also to look at the upper side and be reminded that you are the master weaver of all of these threads of our experience. And though we might not know the tapestry, Lord, we know who weaved the weave. Be with us now, hear our prayers. Be with those that could not be here. Be with those who have forgotten that you are a loving God. And keep us ever mindful of the prayer that Jesus taught us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory Good morning, First Church. The scripture lessons are taken from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 58, verses 9 through 14. The New Testament, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. The book of Isaiah. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help. And he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry 
and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. Then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interest on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways, serving your own interest or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The New Testament is from Luke chapter 13 verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then appeared a woman with a spirit that had been crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Somebody's calling my name. Hallelujah, Hush, children. Hush, children. Somebody's calling my name. Hallelujah. Hush, children. Hush, children. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. What shall I do? What shall I do? Oh, children. Hush, children. Hush, children. Somebody's calling my name.
gave me just what I needed and to get ready for this moment. I'm so happy to be back with all of you. The days go by so quickly, yet when I'm out of town, it seems like it's been a, an eternity since I was here, and it's only been a week. But that just shows you how much I miss you all when I'm not here. Um, that's an interesting song, isn't it? Hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? It's almost like those other spirituals that raise a kind of question. They give both an affirmation and an interrogation at the same time. God is calling me. But the interrogation is, what shall I do? What shall I do? Our ancestors, many of whom could not read the Bible, but they knew the authority of the scriptures because they had heard it and had been told it through the oral tradition. And then what did they do? They created songs about it, that we might not forget the power of what these biblical texts tell us. This morning, I want to speak very briefly on the subject, Come Sunday. Come Sunday, many of you know this piece. We've performed it with the Third Sunday Band. Trey was playing it this morning as part of the interlude. This is the famous song that Duke Ellington wrote. And it was recorded in the 1950s with the great Mahalia Jackson. For many years, Mahalia refused to sing this song because it was associated with the jazz tradition. And Mahalia, coming out of a gospel tradition, didn't want to be associated with jazz. Yet and still, after many years, Duke talked with her and talked with her, and finally they performed it and then recorded it. And it's a timeless version. I want to share with you the words, many of which you already know. Lord, dear Lord above, God of mercy, God of love, please look down and see my people through. Lord, dear Lord of love, God almighty, God above, please look down and see my people through. I believe the sun and moon will shine up in the sky when the day is cloudy I know it's clouds just passing by. He'll give peace and comfort to every troubled mind. Come Sunday, oh, come Sunday. That's the day. And this is the part I like that is so important for this message this morning. Often we'll feel weary, but he knows our every care. Go to him in secret, and you will hear, and he will hear your every prayer. Lilies of the valley, they neither toil nor spin, and flowers bloom in springtime. Birds sing, birds sing. Come Sunday, oh, come Sunday. That's the day. As we listen to our lectionary passage, it talks about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And as many of you know, the Sabbath is the Jewish day that they celebrate when the Lord rested, the seventh day. But as all of you know, we as Christians don't celebrate and do our day of rest on the seventh day. We do it on the first day. Why is that? Well, some have suggested, in part, it's because Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. Come Sunday, that's when they went to see him at the tomb. Why? Because the Sabbath day for the Jews was on Saturday, and they couldn't even mourn on Saturday. So in our Christian tradition, we've lifted up 
Sunday as the Lord's day, the day of rest, the day of replenishing, the day because that's the day that Jesus was resurrected. Come Sunday. Our passage comes from the 13th chapter of Luke where Jesus heals a woman who has been bent over for 18 years. Jesus was teaching on the Sabbath in the synagogue. See, the Jews regard teaching and worshiping as a part of what you can do on the Sabbath, but you can't do any work. So Jesus' teaching was not a breach of the Sabbath. But then what happened? This woman who had come and was encountering Jesus at the synagogue, and it says she was spent, she was bent over. She was so bent over that she couldn't stand up straight for 18 years. And Jesus saw her and brought her to him. And he healed her. He healed her right on the spot. But we know that that's not how the story ends, is it? Because immediately the ruler of the synagogue started criticizing Jesus. I'm going to put it that way. He threw some shade on Jesus because Jesus was healing on the Sabbath day. And said to the woman, come and get healed Monday through Friday, not on the Sabbath, because that's the Lord's day. And then Jesus does what? He rebukes the man and says, even you feed your animals on Sunday. Shouldn't this woman be healed? Come Sunday, for us, not only a day to remember the resurrection, but to come and to worship. A day to come and study. A day to be healed. And so this is, for me, a powerful message because it reminds us that Jesus spent his whole teaching ministry rebuking some of the foolishness and the folly of the synagogue. He was anticipating how the church would do stuff. Because, you know, sometimes in our own religious piety, we start looking at the rules over the righteousness. We start being pragmatic rather than living for purpose and for power that is God's power. Sometimes we will say and step over that person on our way to church if it's on Sunday. And so Jesus is reminding us, doesn't this person deserve to be healed even on Sunday? And he raises the question, and then the people rejoiced. Jesus had taught yet another lesson, not just for the ruler of the synagogue, but to all of us, that to do God's work is good any day, isn't it? It means you can be healed on any time. You can go to God on any time, not just on the appointed worship hour times, but most importantly, any time. God is available, and you have access to be healed in any moment. I have this powerful vision in my own head about this woman. Because if you've ever seen people who are old and sometimes when you get older, your, your bones sometimes get more frail. And sometimes you'll see older people who are literally stooped over and live their life in that posture. And they end up looking down like this. And I was wondering about her perspective of just not being able to, to see, not even to see Jesus. She was just looking down, but he called her. And even in her posture and in her bent over condition, Jesus said, today you shall be healed. And immediately it said she did what? She straightened up. Yes. And then what did she do? She praised God. Yes. There's something magnificent about being broken and bent over and bent down. But God reaching out and say, straighten up. It's even more powerful when the first word of testimony that she gives is praise God. Because that's what Come Sunday is about, isn't it? 
It's not that we haven't bent over. It's not about the fact that we might be bent over once again. But when you get that healing feeling, come on, you got to praise God. And the people saw it and they, over, they were overjoyed. Come Sunday. Beloved, I, I think in a week like this when we struggle with so many wounds in our neighborhoods, in our families, it seems to me that come Sunday, we need to come together as a community of faith and family and be in relationship in a way with each other that we might be healed by being with one another. I can't help but think that some of the people who are hurting and bent over by life or by depression or by addiction, I can't help but think not only can they be healed, but I think coming together on Sunday gives us an opportunity to what? To get some healing. And God sometimes uses us to do the healing. Sometimes I see in the prayer line people just holding on to one another, and I know it's powerful. And sometimes I imagine to myself, there's somebody in this very place that needs to be held on to this very day. And for me, that's come Sunday. Oh, come Sunday. That's the day. That's the day when you can be healed. That's the day that you can be touched. Not so that you can be just simply left alone here in this place, but you are healed that you might, what, go out into the world to do some, what, more healing. You see, come Sunday is, come Sunday and coming to church is just, it's your preparation for the week. And it's finally occurring to me why some people are very religious about coming to church on Sunday. It's so that they can get ready for Monday. And it's because so many of us, I mean, we live a good life, but I can remember my grandparents who worked hard Monday through Saturday night. And come Sunday, was the day not only that you could get all gussied up, but then in the afternoon, what did you do? You didn't go to Target, and you didn't go to Kmart or Walmart. You went to have a meal at the family table. And that very ritual, I believe, helps us to hold on to one another, and we're losing that fabric of being in relationship with one another. That's why the Jews in my neighborhood, every Saturday night, they're breaking bread together as a family. And that community stays together because they're in relationship. And I think we're losing our relationship. I think that somehow or other, we in our middle classness, we in our affluence have gotten away from being in touch with one another one on one. And don't you know that you don't do things to yourself if you're completely connected with other people because you have an obligation to other people. It's when the children know that this whole village is their village. They don't do crazy stuff just willy-nilly. People do crazy stuff when they're not feeling connected, when they feel like nobody cares about what I'm doing. It won't make any difference anyway. That's when they get the futility of the craziness of this present moment. You get people who do stuff just so that they can get some doggone notoriety. They do the, 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 the worst aberrations of behavior so that they can become famous. How sick is that? The power in coming together on Sunday is so that we can get ready for Monday. When I was growing up in Detroit, we loved to play in the winter. And Detroit had some cold winters. But in those cold winters, we could make snowballs, we could have snowball fights, we could build snowmen, we could slip and slide. Even when we didn't have skates, we were still sliding down the street. Winter was great, but it was cold. And so what we would do is, after we had played for a while and got sloppy, cold, and wet, we would go into the house. And some of you are old enough to remember radiators. Yeah. Come on, old folk, y'all know about radiators. This is before we had central air. We had, we had a radiator. And my brother and I, we would run, take off our galoshes, and then put our hands on that steaming hot radiator. And we would keep our hands on that radiator just long enough to what? To get warm. And then what did we do? Go back outside and make some place and snowball. And I think that's what church is. I think we come in to get warmed up, to get tuned up 
to get prepared to do what? To go back out. And beloved, now more than ever, I'm convinced that if we don't hold on to each other in different ways, in creative ways, in ways that allow people who you don't even know to feel like they're cared for, then we are failing as a community of faith. If we don't pay attention, not just to those we know, but especially to those we don't know, we are failing as a church. And so God is giving us a chance to just come in and get warmed up, to get tuned up. Come Sunday is a time, that's the day. But it's the day to get us ready for the rest of the week. Beloved, we have to always live in hope, but we have to also live in the expectation that God needs us and will use us. This current age is an age that has come to us because we have become so fragmented. And that's the purpose of church. We're not going to all like each other. But being in each other's midst, we can learn how to love each other. We were up at Chautauqua all week this week, and we had a great time. Susan Langford and Dan Thompson went up there. <laughs> we, we made the mistake of coming up there, and the, the conversation all week was race and racial rela relations. And so since there were only about eight people who were black up there in the midst of all these hundreds of people, we had to speak for the whole race all week. It was intense. Every time some white person saw, they said, glad you're here. <laughs> and I said, I'm glad to be here too. But more importantly, what I learned is there are a lot of good, well-meaning people in the world who want to know how to help. And they are baffled that they can't change things even with their affluence. Even with their goodwill, why are things not getting better? And they are in part not getting better because they don't know the very people that they want to help. Because they're not in relationship. Because we haven't moved behind, we haven't moved ahead of that greeting. We're glad you're here. We need to sit some folks down at the kitchen table, don't we? At the radiator. Warm up together, talk together, break bread together, and learn something about someone else. The biggest lesson I learned, and I'm going to let you go, but the biggest lesson I learned this week was they had a brother from, from Denver, Miguel Torres, who is a Hispanic theologian. And he was primarily speaking to the white folk, but I heard him loud and clear when he said, you know, we need to speak each other's language. And, and when you don't speak my language and you think you understand my language in translation, you're missing something. And so I took that as a, a call. I've got to learn the other person. I've got to learn their language. I got to learn, as Winton said, I need to learn their rhythms. And, and, and when I do that, then we can be in relationship. We can be in family. We can be the beloved community. You can't be beloved unless you know the person you love him. And you got to be willing to stretch out. So beloved, I'm, I'm charging you even as I charge myself. I'm going to learn Spanish this year. It might take me a while. I haven't learned it all this time. But, but I'm going to make a commitment to move beyond just the salsa beats that I like. Uh, to move beyond the samba beats that I like. Because he said something powerful. He said, you know, when you read, when you read somebody like Federico Garcia Lorca in Spanish, it's different than when you learn it and read it in English. And I got that. And so I'm going to do what he's charged me to do so that I can know this is not about black and white. It's about the people of God. And last time I looked, they come in many different shades. So come Sunday, let this be the day for us to warm up to what God has called us to and then to approach that very next day, that Monday, with the spirit that God has empowered us. Amen.
Beloved, we want to open the doors of the church and say that if you're looking for a place where you can live out your faith, a community that can support you and be supported by you, we invite you to join and become a part of this great community of Faith First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. We do believe that God is still speaking to us, that he's giving us the wisdom and everything we need to testify in the present age. So if you're looking for a church home, if you're studying at Georgia State and you're looking for a church home that's close, we have what we call a special student membership. I was getting ready to say special student discount, but it's, it's, it's not a discount. <laughs> when I began my ministry, I began as a college chaplain. And so I know how important ministry is for college students. It can help shape you at a critical time in your life. So whether you are a student or a teacher or a worker or retired, everybody needs a community of faith. And so as we sing this refrain, I don't feel no ways tired. If someone wants to join the church today, come down and stand with me and we'll take you into full membership. Let us stand and sing the refrain, follow, follow Trey, he'll lead you. the road would be easy I don't believe I don't I don't believe I don't believe he brought me this far hey I don't believe I don't believe, I don't believe. I don't believe he brought me this far. Well, sing it choir. I don't, I don't believe through wind and rain to sleet and snow to segregation and Jim Crow. I don't believe. Brought me this far. So in the old church, they would say he just fixed my sermon because he's saying the sermon. I want to introduce all of you to my friend, the Reverend Eugene Palmore from New York City. Uh, many of you know Gene. He's been around with me for at least 20 or 30 years. He's a protege of Jim Forbes, director of the Ebony Ecumenical Ensemble, wonderful musician as well as preacher and composer arranger. I've asked Gene to give us the, the benediction, but we're so grateful for his spirit. Uh, Jim Forbes would, would not be Jim Forbes without Gene Palmore, and so we're grateful for the fact that he came and saying a bit and fix my sermon and, and now he's gonna now he's gonna give he's gonna give the benediction.
Brothers and sisters, I'm so grateful to be here today. My brother Dwight has always opened his arms to me, and I have been so blessed to be welcomed into this church. I'm so glad you did come Sunday today. It reminds me of another Duke Ellington song that makes me feel that every new day is a good day. It says, I like the sunrise because it brings a new day. I like the new day. It brings new hope, they say. We can come to the radiator and get hope. We can come inside and then we can go. So I ask now that you repeat after me. I must live with myself. And so, I want to be fit for myself to know. I don't want to come to the setting sun hating myself for the things I have not done. Beloved, what would Jesus have us to do? He would have us to understand that when we come on Sunday, we are not to stop, that we are to go out with Sunday into Monday and into Tuesday and into Wednesday and into Thursday and let somebody know, not just by our talk but by our walk, that we are doing God's work in the world today. So may God go with you. May the peace of God be with you. Do what is just, do what is right, do what is good. Do all things with love, do all things with mercy. Love for yourself, love for each other, and love for God. The peace of God be with you.